this person says it's from uh, Bishop McClendon. Uh, Pastor Jennings, I'd like you to stop talking about preachers on the Word and on, and on TBN. Bishop McClendon is a member of the Full Gospel Baptist Organization in which Paul Morton is our presiding bishop. Mm. I don't think he will be happy about your Truth of God program. Paul Morton. <laughs> we are demanding that you stop preaching harsh words. The confrontation between Bishop Clarence McClendon and Pastor Gino Jennings was a highly anticipated event within religious circles, stemming from a series of public criticisms and doctrinal disputes that had reached a boiling point. Pastor Jennings, renowned for his unwavering commitment to biblical literalism and his fiery, direct preaching style, had long targeted Bishop McClendon in his sermons and television broadcasts. Jennings' criticisms were not merely theological, but also personal. He accused McClendon of promoting a prosperity gospel, a controversial doctrine that promises financial and material blessings to believers who exhibit strong faith and contribute financially to the church. Jennings viewed this as a perversion of Christian teachings, arguing that it exploited vulnerable believers by equating faith with financial success and suggesting that material wealth was a sign of divine favor. This message, according to Jennings, diverted attention from the core Christian values of humility, charity, and spiritual growth. They are demanding. Come on! We are demanding that you stop preaching harsh words about our great pastors throughout this country. And our presiding bishop and Bishop McClendon will have a word with you. We would like for you to fellowship with us and become a true holiness preacher. You're not a holiness preacher. No. I'll tell you what you do. Why don't you get McCulloch and Morton? Right. Tag team up. That's right. That's it. Amen. Let's have a tag team. That's right. McCulloch and Morton. Right, man. And God and I. That's right. That's right. We are praying God's word. That's right. Man. In addition to his theological critiques, Jennings was outspoken about what he saw as McClendon's ostentatious lifestyle. He condemned McClendon for living in luxury, which Jennings believed was antithetical to the example set by Jesus Christ. Christ, who led a life marked by humility and service, stood in stark contrast to the image Jennings painted of McClendon. A leader more concerned with wealth and status than with the spiritual well belling of his flock. Jennings' broadcasts were unrelenting, and his harsh rhetoric contributed to a growing controversy that not only put McClendon on the defensive, but also sparked intense discussions among Christians about the nature of true leadership and the interpretation of the gospel. I take the full gospel entire organization yes, sir. and I make it lick up every lie you preach. That's right. If you think I'm bluffing, call my bluff. Amen. You believe you don't have to be baptized. Right. Paul Morton denounced the baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. That proves he's nothing but a sinner in the pulpit. Feeling that Jennings' attacks were not only unjust, but also damaging to his reputation and ministry, Bishop McClendon decided that the situation required a direct response. McClendon, who also enjoyed a significant following, was known for his charismatic preaching and his ability to inspire hope and confidence in his congregation. He believed that his teachings on prosperity were biblically sound and that his success and wealth were manifestations of God's blessings, proof that faith could lead to tangible rewards in this life. McClendon argued that his ministry had transformed lives, providing spiritual guidance and material support to countless individuals. However, the relentless criticism from Jennings threatened to overshadow these achievements and cast doubt on his integrity and motives. In a move that took many by surprise, McClendon reached out to Jennings, requesting a face-to-face -face meeting to address the escalating conflict. This decision was seen by some as a bold and conciliatory gesture, an attempt to resolve their differences through dialogue rather than through continued public confrontation. For McClendon, this meeting was an opportunity to defend his teachings and lifestyle directly, to appeal to Jennings' sense of fairness, and to seek a resolution that would mitigate the damage to his reputation. He hoped that by engaging Jennings in person, he could present his perspective in a way that might soften Jennings' stance, or at least lead to a more private and constructive critique. It represented not just a personal confrontation, but a clash of ideologies, two distinct interpretations of Christianity coming face to face. For him, 
This was an opportunity to reiterate his concerns directly and to challenge McClendon to reflect on the criticisms and the potential harm of his teachings. Jennings believed that true leadership required holding others accountable, especially those who held significant influence over believers. Both men were passionate about their beliefs and committed to their respective interpretations of Christian doctrine. McClendon sought to articulate his understanding of prosperity as a divine promise, emphasizing that his teachings were grounded in Scripture and aimed at inspiring believers to achieve their full potential. He argued that wealth and success, when used responsibly, could be tools for greater good, enabling believers to support charitable causes and uplift their communities. McClendon also defended his personal lifestyle, suggesting that his prosperity was a testament to God's blessings and a model for what faithful living could achieve. Jennings, however, remained steadfast in his critique. He argued that the prosperity gospel distorted the true message of Christianity, placing undue emphasis on material wealth and diverting attention from spiritual growth and ethical living. Jennings contended that McClendon's teachings risked misleading believers fostering a transactional view of faith where financial contributions were seen as a means to secure divine favor. This, Jennings believed, was a dangerous departure from the teachings of Jesus, who emphasized selflessness, humility, and service to others. He urged McClendon to consider the impact of his message on vulnerable believers who might be led to equate their spiritual worth with their financial success. Despite the intensity of their discussion, both men were conscious of the need to handle their disagreement in a manner that reflected their faith. They understood that their confrontation was being closely watched and that its outcome would have implications for their ministries and for the broader Christian community. Both leaders were aware that a public conflict could further polarize their followers, while a resolution could set an example of Christian reconciliation and mutual respect, even amid deep doctrinal differences. McClendon and Jennings each remained committed to their perspectives and their theological disagreements persisted. However, the very act of meeting and engaging in dialogue was significant. It demonstrated a willingness to confront conflict directly and to seek understanding, even if complete agreement was not achieved. For McClendon, the meeting was a chance to humanize himself to Jennings and his critics, to show that he was not merely a target of condemnation, but a fellow believer striving to fulfill his understanding of his divine calling. For Jennings, it was an opportunity to articulate his concerns face to face and to challenge McClendon to reconsider his approach. Supporters of McClendon hoped that the encounter would lead to a reduction in public criticisms, allowing his ministry to proceed without the constant shadow of controversy. They saw McClendon's willingness to meet with Jennings as a sign of his commitment to dialogue and reconciliation. Followers of Jennings, on the other hand, looked for signs that their leader's firm stance had prompted any reflection or change in McClendon's teachings. They admired Jennings for his unwavering commitment to what he saw as biblical truth and his willingness to hold influential leaders accountable. The confrontation between Bishop McClendon and Pastor Jennings highlighted the ongoing debates within Christianity about the interpretation of biblical teachings and the responsibilities of church leaders. It underscored the challenges of balancing the pursuit of doctrinal purity with the need for unity and mutual respect within the Christian community. The meeting served as a reminder that, despite deep-seated differences, dialogue and direct engagement are essential components of addressing conflicts and fostering understanding. Ultimately, the encounter between McClendon and Jennings was a microcosm of larger theological and ethical debates that continue to shape the Christian landscape. It brought to the forefront questions about the role of wealth and prosperity in Christian life, the responsibilities of religious leaders, and the ways in which faith should be expressed and lived out. Whether or not the meeting led to significant changes in their respective approaches, it provided a valuable example of the importance of addressing conflicts directly and the potential for dialogue to bridge divides even when complete agreement remains elusive.